Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at our Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Uh, my name is Dave Everett, and uh, we're getting ready to start our Sunday morning service this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Facebook, and we're not aware where you may be listening from. Anyway, um, God bless you. Uh, just a couple of anna regular announcements that we have. We will have our Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, right here on Facebook Live, we'll be continuing our study through uh, the book Don't Limit God by Andrew Womack. Uh, we continue to have our free Bible classes, are free, absolutely free. Uh, and you just go to our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. Go to our Bible class page and uh, just register for free and then uh, we'll, we'll get you dialed in. So anyway, um, those are always free. Uh, and then uh, thank you for those who have been supporting us. Uh, through our giving. Uh, we have a giving page on our website. We are a 501c3. We are a church. Uh, a Lighthouse Establishment Center is the name of our church. Anyway, uh, you can give on our, again, on our website at lighthouseestablishment.org. Thank you for giving. We've actually had a, uh, a fairly good month this month, and uh, we have a little bit of deficit from last month, but we're uh, just uh, we're picking right back up God's uh, source. And I don't sit shut on a lot, but uh, so if you are interested, uh, it, that's what it is. And so thank you for that. And, and uh, uh, hey, well, without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, just jump into our message this morning. I'm going to be starting a new series this morning called Rest in His Goodness. It's really a sequel or a continuation of my previous series on, uh, um, sorry, uh, The Garden Restored. Thank you. My wife was quoting that to me. Uh, the Garden Restored. So anyway, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about resting in his goodness. You know, back in 2004, let me just share a little bit of a testimony. Uh, we were living in, in the house at Covina at the time, and uh, Sherry and I, we were at a crossroads of making some decisions. Uh, most of those have to do with financial decisions, and anyone who's married, anyone who's living, they understand what those decisions can be at times. Anyway, uh, we were praying about something, and at the time, we both were not emotionally handling it very well. <laughs> we were no more murmuring and complaining than anything else, but we were crying out to God, looking for direction. We were just kind of, which way do we go, right or left? Our, our stance, you know, we just didn't know which way we'd go. We knew we needed to make a decision, but we didn't know which one was the right one. And we were we were very perplexed at the time. But as we were, I, I want to say we were crying out to God, uh, but I, I felt like we were more murmuring and complaining than anything. But at the same point in time, as we're crying out to God, Sherry gets this word, and, uh, and we receive it from the Lord, and it says, Rest in my goodness, and I will take care of everything. Rest in my goodness, and I will take care of everything. And through the years, I have actually been a very anchored word for the Lord that we have used throughout uh, the rest of our lives, throughout the 20 years of our marriage, uh, throughout this ministry. And so we're going to um, be teaching on that. And that's why, as, even though this is a continuation of my previous series, The Garden Restored, I wanted to make this a distinct uh, a series, uh, The Rest of His Goodness, because it's very... It's very key for us, and so uh, I just wanted to be able to reference that in our archive of videos and whatnot. So, resting in His goodness, and we're going to be taking over the next few weeks to talk about every aspect of that phrase or that, that word from God. What it means to rest in Him. What it means to what it, what it means to rest in His goodness. What does His goodness entail? What it means when when God says, "I will take care of everything," and not only there's two parts of that too. Not only does He take care of everything, leaving nothing out, but he does it. We don't do it, he does it. Now he might do it in and through us and in and through others, but he does it. And we rest and we trust him. And we're gonna find out as we're talking about rest, it will have a lot to do with trust. When we're relying on his goodness, not our goodness, not other people's <coughs> goodness. God might use other people but they're not the source. Uh, my job, our jobs are not the source. His resting in His goodness, and He will, not could, not should, but will take care of everything. You know, back in 2010, that was 2004, but 2010, we were talking with a pastor friend who was actually in our home at the time, and uh, Sherry was actually in the other room talking, I think, to the pastor's wife, and we, I was talking to the pastor's husband in, in, in the, I think, the living room. We were having two distinct conversations with two, in two different types of the house. And 
I had, in the conversation I was having with the pastor, somehow this whole story that I just shared with you in 2004 uh, came up in conversation. And I didn't know what was going on in the other conversation in the other room with Sherry and the pastor's wife. And, uh, and as I, just as I had just shared the testimony about resting in his goodness, uh, and he will take care of everything, Sherry comes from the other room and, and shares the same story. And it was just, I don't know, it, it probably was up before us, but it was just very, and at the time too we were going through some things, not as major, but we were going through some things uh, that we were wrestling with. And, uh, and so it was just, again, just another story of how, how God has used this phrase to minister not just to Sherry or to myself, but to both of us throughout our ministry, throughout our lives, throughout our marriage, uh, about resting in His goodness and He will take care of everything. So anyway, that kind of, that's kind of the backdrop be, behind this, uh, this phrase that we got from the Lord, and we've used this throughout our lives. But we're going to be talking about, over the next couple weeks, uh, at the beginning, we're going to break this up, talk about resting in God, resting in His goodness. We're going to be talking about His goodness. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, when God says He will take care of everything. And more specifically, we'll be talking with that, you know, walking in the blessing of the Lord and, and, and how God will take care of everything. His faithfulness to us. So with that, with that, with that said, and, and uh, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles this morning, if you have it, to Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two is where we're going to start. We're going to be talking about rest, and then as we talk about rest, and I don't think I'm going to finish all my notes on rest today, but we we'll, we'll also be talking about a Sabbath rest, which we're going to see this word Sabbath and rest go hand in hand. That's not going to be. All that we studied about with this topic, but we're going to be talking about rest. The Bible has a lot to say about rest, uh, and so resting in Him. So let's go ahead and get started where it all begins in Genesis chapter two. And actually, I want to I want to uh, read this verse at the end of chapter one. So Genesis one thirty one, and it says, "And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good." And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. There's a lot in here, and I'm not necessarily going to uh, go through every single part of this uh, passage here in Genesis chapter 2 this morning. We might refer back to some of this a little bit later as we go in our study. But we, God created the heavens and earth in six days. And then on the seventh day, He rested. He rested from His work. God didn't rest because He was tired. God rested because... He had completed the work. You know, uh, keep your finger here in Genesis chapter 2, but if you will toggle with me real quick to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 verse 28. And I just want to use this as a, as a supporting verse, but it says, and uh, I want to be in the New King James, so I need to toggle my Bible to the King, New King James. Says, have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. There's a lot in that verse right there, and it goes on to say, let me just go ahead and read out the context. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord, those who in other words, I can rephrase that. Those who trust in the Lord, those who rest in the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. But the main reason I went to this passage in verse 28, Isaiah 4, 40, 28, towards the end, it says that God neither, <coughs> excuse me, God neither faints or nor is weary. Taking that back into context of Genesis chapter 2, God did not rest on the seventh day because he was tired. God rested on the seventh day because
because he had completed the work. The way I picture that is like a painter. You know, when a painter paints a portrait or paints a, a painting, if he would add one more stroke to that painting, he would ruin it. He would make it it'd be, because it doesn't need it anymore. It's completed. It's finished. It's like a lawyer who, uh, when they, they present their case, and they take, they'll, they'll make a statement that they rest their case because there's nothing more to be shared. There's nothing more to be said. They rest their case in the matter. Is that making sense? God rested, not because he was tired, because God doesn't grow weary. God doesn't, God does not get tired. But he rested because the work was completed. He, that echoed in, 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 in the, the ending of chapter 1 when God said, God saw everything that he had made and beheld it was very good. He didn't need to change anything. He didn't need, you know, and, and God made everything to procreate. God made every, 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 uh, tree and shrub and seed. God made every animal and insect. God made every human being, male and female, to procreate. God hasn't created another tree. God has not created another grain of grass. God has not created another, another apple. God has not created another dog or, or cat or, or anything. God, <coughs> and God has not created new genders. <laughs> uh, let me just throw that out there. God has not created anyone new. God has finished the work. And, and the beauty about that too, and we'll get into this a little deeper, but when God created the heavens and the earth, He didn't create man on the first day. And I'm glad He didn't create us first. If He created man on the first day, man would would just existed. With no, all that would have been it was light. <laughs> You know, he didn't, he, he, didn't, he didn't create us in the middle where, where all the world was water. Otherwise, if God created man first, he would have been treading water for two days. God waited till there was land. God waited till the, there was vegetation and food. God waited till there was sunshine. You know, there was light. There was no sun yet. That was the first day. God waited till it was completed. And as he completed the work, up to the fifth day, God created man with a completed and perfect universe, with a perfect earth, with the perfect heavens and earth and, 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 and its perfection. Because God created everything and he said it was very good. And then he rested from his work. Then he ceased. He didn't have to create, he didn't have to make it more perfect. He didn't have to, need to create more things. God created man and female. God created us in his own image. And he said it was very good. And he rested from his work. Man was created last, and God, and man was, and, and let me, I have this in my notes. Man, God created man last, and then moved him into his rest. That's a very important point I'm going to make, and you'll see this throughout this message, is that God created man, man last, and then moved him into his rest. And we're going to see this throughout the scripture throughout this, this, this uh, message, this, at least this portion of this message, that that really is the Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest is not so much the seventh day, and we'll deal with this, but it's, 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 it's resting in His completed work in everything that He's done. We'll be looking at that a little bit more closely uh, in a few moments. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, Let me just uh, move forward with my notes here. Excuse me with that. You know, let me just do make a point here. It, it does go into what I want to say. You know, going back to when God created man last. God created man after he had created the heavens and the earth. How, how, after he had created the, 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 the sea and the land. After he had created the, the sun and the moon and the stars. After he had created every tree and shrub and herb and plant. How they created all the animals and insects and whatnot. God, Adam, see, at the beginning, Adam did not have to plant and wait seven years for every fruit tree to produce. Some, some, I know some things don't take that long. He didn't have to wait seven years. He, God created uh, man when he was able to eat. Could you imagine man being created and he having to wait seven years before he can eat anything? Any fruit, any no. He God created man on, in, 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 a, in a perfect universe, in a perfect environment, 
It was perfect climate. It was perfect everything. God didn't. It, God, God provided. See, part of the Sabbath rest that we're going to be talking about, part of this resting in His goodness that we're going to be talking about, God provided everything man needed. The climate, the weather, the 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 the, the, the His food, His vegetation, dry land, and everything that He needed. It was perfect. How did you know? And we'll look at this a little more closely, but the Old Testament is a shadow of the New. We're going to bring that out in Paul's writings uh, uh, a little bit later. But the Old Testament is a shadow of the New. In the New Testament, we don't have to struggle to receive from God. We're going to see this in the, in this, in the series. We can rest in His goodness. We don't have to struggle to receive from God. Jesus provided everything we will need before we were ever saved. We're going to look at that in this series. God, God through Christ, provided everything we ever need. God, God at creation provided everything mankind, Adam and Eve, needed. All Adam had to do was rest in his goodness and receive what God had provided. Through Christ, in Christ, and we, when I did a series earlier in this year on in Christ realities, there's hundreds of scriptures about who we are in Christ. And all we have to do is rest in his goodness, rest in the finished work of the cross, rest in everything God has provided us. We have the mind of Christ. We have wisdom. We have, we have the ability to work with our hands, for God to bless the work of our hands. You know, there's so many aspects that could take this, but we, all we have to do is rest in what Christ has provided and receive. Yes, we might have a part to play in that, but we're, even though we have a part to play in that, we're not resting in what we do. We're resting in what He does, that He gives us the ability to do what we do. He gives us the wisdom that He blesses the work of our hands. We can work with our hands, but if He doesn't bless the work of our hands, we can work till, till, till the cows come home, and we're not going to be blessed. We need to rest in His goodness, because every good and perfect gift comes from Him, not us. Not our employer, not our government, it comes from Him. But we have to learn. We have to, we're going to find out, we have to labor to enter into that rest. We have to learn how to rest in His goodness. We have to learn to rest in what He has already provided for us in Christ Jesus. Am I making sense so far? This is just kind of introductory to where I'm going with some of this. We'll go into a little more detail as we go forward. <clears throat> I want to look at some scriptures here before I get into the really what I want to get into this morning. But go with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to jump all the way to the back of the book. Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus is dealing with seven churches. The last church he deals with is the church of Laodicea. And it's really known as, and I've taught about this before, <coughs> in my series called Jesus in the Revelation. Seeing Jesus in the Revelation, I think is the title of that series. But I, I spent two weeks on these seven churches. But the seventh church is what I call the church in its worst condition. This church is, a, of, all, of the seven churches, this church is a backslidden church, and it's in its worst condition. It's, it's, a, it's a lukewarm church. And Jesus makes the, the strongest uh, reprovement, the strongest uh, correction, the strongest discipline to this church. The strongest rebuke he makes to this church. But it's this church that is in its worst condition <coughs> that we come to this most famous passage of Scripture, verse 20, Revelation 3.20, and it says, Behold, I, Jesus speaking, standing at the door, stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Verse 21. To him that overcometh. And actually, I want to transition to the New King James. Let me read verse 21 again. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, in this passage of scripture, especially verse 20, you know, through the years as I grew up, I've always heard this, how Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And most of the context that I've heard this scripture has been Jesus standing on the door of the, the lost, wanting to come in. I don't disagree with that, 
necessarily, and Jesus is standing in the door of everyone's heart to come in. But at the same point in time, he's not, if we look at the context, he's not talking to the lost. He's talking to the church. Yet, granted, he's talking to a church in its worst condition. Granted, he's talking to a church in a backslidden, lukewarm state. But he's talking to his church. It applies to the lost, and I'm, I'm not, I would not discount that. But he's talking to his church. He's talking to uh, his church, and he's, but even in the church in its worst condition, Jesus is standing at the door knocking. That tells me a lot right there. Even in our worst condition, even in a backslidden, lukewarm state, Jesus did not abandon us. We abandoned him. He, we, he did not leave. Why is he on the other side of the door in the first place? It's not, because, it's not of his doing, it's of our doing. We're the, we're the ones stuck. We're the ones that left. We're the ones that are lost. We're the ones that are lukewarm. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking, uh, I'm not addressing anyone specific. I'm just, uh, uh, I'm speaking this, uh, there's a word I'm looking for, but uh, anyway, forget that. Just catch it. Come back. You know, Jesus is standing at the, the door knocking. That tells me that even in our worst condition, if we, if we find ourselves in that place, Jesus is knocking. And he's never stopped knocking. And why is he knocking? He's not knocking to scold us. He's not knocking to rebuke us, even though he, he may, may need to do that. He may need to reprove us, because all scripture is possible for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The third man, may be, man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Reproof is good. Discipline is good. Any good athlete, any good, anyone who's been successful in any field, any vocation, any sport, has had good discipline. We're, we're, Jesus came to make us disciples. A disciple is a disciplined learner. Discipline is good. The word disciple and the word discipline in the Greek are almost identical, same word. There's nothing wrong with discipline. There's not, it's healthy to be disciplined. It's healthy to be disciples. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8, You shall be my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you're not being disciplined, if you're not being discipled, you're not going to know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, the truth is not going to set you free. It's not the truth that sets you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's the truth that you know that sets you free. So we need discipline. But Jesus is standing at the door and knocking so that he can come in to have a relationship. This whole scripture, this whole passage is about Jesus coming in to have a relationship, to sup with you and you with him. He's not knocking on your door to rebuke you in the sense that he's going to condemn you. He might rebuke you, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We, Jesus is knocking on the door because he wants to have a relationship with you. With you. That describes righteousness because righteousness is about having a right relationship with God. There might need to be some cleansing in the process, but the, that, the cleansing is not so much the goal as it is a relationship. The, relation, the cleansing is a means to, it, 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 to the goal. The goal is a relationship. God wants a relationship with us. But part of that process might mean that we need some cleansing up. Not so much, not so much for his benefit, but for our, we need to get our brainwashed <laughs> in a good way. Some of us need to, need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That we might know the good and perfect will of God. We need to, we need to change our stinking thinking. And I did this go more way off where I want to go to. But God, I'm talking about resting in his goodness. But some of us can't rest in His goodness if we're lukewarm, if we're, if we're doing it our own way. We need Him to come in and sup with us and share with us the ways of life and, and change our thinking. And it might make making sense. But then He goes on. It's in this context that He makes this statement, verse 21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Jesus is standing on the door knocking to His church, a church in its worst condition. So that he can not only come in and sup with him and have a relationship with him, but he is granting the church in his worst condition to come and sit with him on this throne. 
I don't know of anything that's more honorable than to be able to sit with him on his throne. And I don't know about you, but when I see the word sit, I get in my mind the idea of rest. Sit, rest with me on my throne as I have overcome and sit with my Father on his throne. Not only do we have a position of rest and relationship with God, but I'm not going to go here so much into serious, but if, if we're going to sit with him on his throne, that speaks of authority. We have authority. We're born in it. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. We're born into victory. We're born into authority. Okay, but uh, that's not so much the script of my message right now. I mean, but he said that we can sit with him on so that goes with me, go with me to Ephesians chapter two. And I just quoted from there. Uh, I wasn't gonna, uh, I forgot that was part of my notes. But Ephesians chapter two, go ahead and turn with me in verse four. I want to take you back on this phrase. Sit with him on his throne, because we're talking about resting in his goodness. Specifically right now we're talking about rest. And Paul writes in, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy, He's rich in mercy. Or I could spend all day on that. Because of His great love which He had loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. Look at the church of Laodicea, the church in His work condition. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's that place of rest again. Our place of rest with is with him on his throne in Christ Jesus. That's a place of rest. God wants us to rest in his goodness. Not because we've earned it, no. We become this great mercy by which he has loved us. We, this position of rest is not because we've earned it. This position to sit with him on the throne is not because we've earned it. Nothing we've earned. If we can earn it, we don't need Jesus. We have it because of his great mercy, of his great grace. That he, he says, by grace we've been saved. It begins by saying in verse 4 that... God who is rich in mercy because of his great love towards us. This whole relationship we have, this whole righteousness we have with Christ is because of his goodness. For he who knew, knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That we might be born into right relationship with God because of Christ Jesus. Anything we have is because of his goodness. Because of his mercy, his grace, his love for us, the goodness and mercy of God. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> and we'll pick it up verse 11. And it says, And every priest stands ministering daily. <clears throat> And offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, <clears throat> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time with waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being Sanctified. There's a lot here, and I'm not going to have time right now to go into depth with everything that's here. And that's a, so much the scope of my message. We'll come back to verse 13 a little bit later in our study about Kardaha. He had made his enemies his footstool. We'll come back and, and talk about that more towards the end of the series. But I just want to make reference to him right now that Jesus, our high priest, wasn't like the priest of Levi. Where he had to keep, they had to keep making the same sacrifices year after year after year. Jesus, when he made the one sacrifice, sat down and rested on the throne. It's a, it's a rest, there's a finished work. Je, just like Adam and Eve, mankind, was created 
after God had finished the creation, man was created, new creations in Christ Jesus, after Jesus finished the work and sat down. We're going to see this in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, a little bit later in our study, where we have been, by his blood, we have been made kings and priests to reign with us on the earth. Jesus sat down because the work was finished. And it's in this finished work, and it's in, in this finished salvation that God has provided. See, God provided salvation in Christ Jesus. He did the work and then created us new in Christ Jesus. He created us in a new, rightful relationship with God, just like God created the heavens and the earth and then created man. The whole I'm going to get into I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but the Old Testament is a shadow of the new, including creation, including Sabbath, and we're going to get into that. It's all a shadow of the new. And so God created everything. God created everything perfect for man, and then he created man. God recreated man in Christ Jesus. He made everything good, made everything perfect, and he has invited man to sit down with him on his throne. The throne that he sits on after he had finished everything on the cross. This whole message in entirety is talking about resting in his goodness. Resting in the finished work of the cross. We're not resting in our goodness. And anything we have is because of God and His goodness. And any goodness that we have from God is because of what He's done in Christ Jesus. Everything, including creation, including those, all Scripture, it says in John, point, it testifies of Jesus, testifies of Christ. All that points to the cross, all that points to Jesus, including the Sabbath, including creation. Including this rest. I mean, everything points to Jesus. There's a lot of types and shadows in the Levitical law about the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and different things, but it all points to the real lamb. It's a shadow of the real. Through the Old Testament law, we have there was a lamb that had to be sacrificed every day, actually two times a day, called the burnt offering. And then once a year. And there's so many different feasts and Sabbaths and Sabbaths. There's more than one kind of Sabbath. We're going to look at that. There's not just a weekly Sabbath. There's a, a yearly a Sabbath, seven year Sabbath. There's Sabbath. The, talk, the Bible talks about. We're going to look at some of that. And, but all this, po everything points to Jesus. And everything points to us being right with God through Jesus Christ. There's only one thing that can make you holy, there's only one thing that can set you free. There's only one thing that can enable you to rest in anything, and that's through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And it's through this work that Jesus did that he accomplished. It was so, see, see I hope you've seen this picture. God created the heaven and earth in six days, and then on the seventh, he rested. Jesus went to the cross. This child that was born to us, this son that was given to us, came to us to die a very horrible death. The one, the most horrible death that in, 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 in any time of uh, history has been the whole crucifixion and everything that he went through. But Jesus, upon finishing that work, sat down. He rested in a very similar fashion that God rested at the creator of the heavens and the earth in a very natural way. I hope you've seen the, the comparison that God created the heavens and the earth and rested. And Jesus went to the cross and sat down. He didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because it was finished. It was done. It was complete. Hopefully we're seeing that. Um, let's go with, real quick with me to the book of Haggai. Or Haggai, as some pronounce. Haggai is in the Old Testament. It's the third from the end of the Old Testament. So go to Malachi and go back two books. We're going to go to chapter 1. We'll pick it up verse 2. I'm going to read a little bit of a portion of scripture here. So you get the context. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come. The time of the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai. 
<coughs> excuse me, the prophet saying, It is time for is it time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? That's a question. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, verse 10, the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> for I call for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil on whatever the ground brings forth, on man and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Now there's a lot here. Again, I'm not going to go into every single detail here. It's not the scope of my message. But the book of, ha the book of Haggai, the prophet Haggai, the, ministry, the message from Haggai, is that it was during the time of Israel returning back to the land after being in exile. And they had one main objective. That was, we, we see parts of the story through uh, Ezra, we see parts of the story through Nehemiah, but this is from Haggai. And Haggai, uh, the main purpose of them going back was to rebuild the temple. Now remember, the Old Testament is a shadow of the New. There's types of shadow, and it's also an oka. We read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, specifically, it's also echoed in chapter 10, that we are under a new covenant. A new covenant. You know, in the Old Covenant, we had to work, let me just say, in the New Covenant, we are not trusting what we do, we trust what He did. We trust what Christ, we have a New Covenant with God. It's not based on us, it's based on Him. We're gonna, we're, we'll get into some of this a little bit later as we talk about Sabbath, and as we talk about some things about, about, about this rest. We're also specifically talking about resting in His goodness, and He will take care of everything. Am I, am I making myself clear? Haggai, they went, they went with the intention to rebuild the temple, and they started well. They started building the temple of God, but then they got distracted building their own paneled houses. They got distracted doing their own thing. How many of us have started well in this Christian life, in this Christian walk, but through the walk we get distracted? We get distracted with our jobs, we get distracted with our families, we get distracted around the holidays, we get distracted about this, we have a trial, we have a tragedy, we get distracted, we get distracted, we mean well, but we got distracted. And, 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 and it's not so much that we get distracted, that's one thing, but in the distracted we start trusting ourselves and stop trusting Him. That's where I'm going with this, because we're talking about Resting in his goodness. And I'm talking about when I talk about resting in his goodness, I'm talking about trusting him, not us. Don't be wise in our own life. In all of our ways of knowledge in him, and he will direct our path straight. He's our shepherd. He's our king. He's our guide. But we we start out well, but then we drift and we start trusting and reasoning and coming to conclusion on our own wisdom. And we get in trouble. And to me, I love this. Even how how, how how harsh it is, but he's painting the picture that when we do it our own selves, we, and, and he points it out in verse 6, <clears throat> you have so much, but bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages, put him in a bag with holes there. Some of us, you know, you just read my mail. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, that's exactly what I feel like. Everything I touch, everything, it just seems to be... Not only does it seem to, to not work out, not only does it seem like it falls apart, but it just seems to be, there's this, and I spoke on this a few weeks ago, there's this dissatisfaction. It's unfulfilling. It's empty. It, it's void. And, and, and perhaps some of the things that we're doing are not, it, it's not that God doesn't want us to have our own homes. It is not that he didn't want them to have a place to live. But the priorities are back. 
and they're focused on backwards. Sometimes we can do the right thing the wrong way, where we're trusting us and not trusting Him. And God will blow away the satisfaction till we come to a place where we're going to rest in His goodness. Because He is going to take care of everything. When we're going to do it our own ways. He does us not out of, out of anger, in the sense that He's trying to punish us. He does us out of discipline because He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to teach us to trust Him. Am I making sense? You know... We have so many New Testament examples with even even the apostles, disciples at the time. But God, Jesus would tell them to go feed the multitudes. And they were reasoning in their own thinking, how am I going to feed the multitudes? They didn't have enough money, they didn't have enough food to feed the multitudes. But God was trying to teach them, don't rest in, don't trust in, don't rest in your natural provision. Trust, rest in my goodness. Because twice, actually more than twice, there was times where Jesus brought the discussion up about walking on the water, about calming the... You know, they were marveled that he could calm the storms in the sea. And in context, I think this is in Mark's version, but Jesus rebukes them because of the hardness of heart. When we don't... Not, when we forget that we have a miraculous working God, when we have a God that can feed the multitudes with the boys' lunch, when we forget that this is a God who calmed the storm and, and departed the Red Sea, and we, when we forget how miraculous, when we, miraculous our God is, when we forget about the goodness of our God, and we stop resting in His goodness, and we are now just looking at everything from a natural point of view. The Bible, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, to be naturally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When we, our lens that we look at life is always natural instead of spiritual. Instead of looking through the goodness of God, through, the, through, through this, uh, who, we're sitting with Him on His throne. He, put a, he has put all things underneath our feet. He has given us the same exhortation, the same excitement to go feed the multitude. He, he give, he, he, we have the same ability to walk in the water, to cast the net on the other side, to do everything Jesus did and more, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to, to, to cast out devils. Freely we receive, freely we give. But so many times, even in ministry, even in doing that, we do it our own way and our own strength instead of resting in His goodness because He, not us, will do, take care of everything. Because it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by, live by the faith of God and Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. We need to change our lens. And we need to rest in His goodness. And, and, and when you continue to read the story in Haggai, when they begin to trust God, when they begin to do it His way, instead of doing it our way, to quote, to quote Frank Sinatra, we get in trouble. We make a mess. And even if we did it well, as far as maybe we made our life a success, maybe everything's going well and it's a bed of roses for our family, even amidst COVID and everything else going on. But if we did it in our own strength, the Bible says anything that's not a faith is sin. I don't want to. I don't want to have a successful life. I don't want to have a, a, a victorious life because I did it. I want to have a successful life. To me, success that's not success. Success to me is being in the center of God's will. Knowing that He will take care of everything. Am I making sense? Uh, uh, and so, uh, this is again just really just uh, introductory to where I want to go to. Go with me real quick to John 15. John 15, verse 5. Again, I'm not going to read the whole context. But it says, I, it says, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. This is really kind of summing up what I just said. We're talking about resting in his goodness. To me, resting in his goodness means abiding in him, and he abiding in us. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. But if we are abiding in Him, we will bear much fruit. What's the fruit? The fruit can be not just provision in our life, 
not just okay, okay. <coughs> thank you, Matt. But to me, the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, etc. We have the fruit of God. The fruit of God in our lives. But we're, we're bearing much, we're bearing good fruit. Fruit that's good. It's good fruit. We're talking about resting in His goodness. And we want to bear good fruit. But it's His fruit. It's not our fruit. It's we're, because we're abiding in Him. If we're abiding in Him, then He's the root. He's the source. And the fruit that comes out of that is fruit that's from above. It's His goodness. Some of the things that we're producing, they might be the right fruit, but the, the source is us. The source is what we did, not what He did in and through us. There's a difference. Okay, am I making sense? We're talking about resting, but we're talking about abiding in Him. Okay? Go with me to another one real quick. Philippians chapter 4. We've heard this many times, but verse 13. It says, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can do all things. But if you leave out the second half of that verse, then you have just made an island to yourselves. You know, selfishness, self-centeredness is idolatry. Stubbornness is idolatry, Scripture says. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to uh, step on people's feet, but again, I am. We can do all things not, that means nothing's excluded. We can do all things through Christ, through resting in His goodness. We can do all, He can do every, rest in His goodness and He can do everything. We can do all things, everything, through Christ, through resting in His goodness. Am I making sense? Who gives us faith? Go with me, uh, well, actually, before we go to Go there. You can go ahead and start training with me to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to be spending I don't, whatever time I have left today in Hebrews chapter 4. Actually, before you go there, sorry, uh, backtrack, go back with me to Genesis chapter 2 real quick. And then we're going to go to Hebrews 4. But let me just say this as you're turning, even though I got you all confused. A baby sits. Before it learns to walk. Our baby learns to sit. Before it learns to walk. Before we walk this Christian life. Before we. Walk in the spirit. So we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.15. We need to learn how to sit in his presence. We need to learn how to sit. Under the word of God. We need to learn how to sit. Under good teaching. We need to learn how to sit, abiding in Him. A baby learns to sit before it learns to walk. We need to learn how to sit. You know, a seed, when you plant a seed, it sits. You plant it, it sits wherever you bury it. It sits being watered. It sits receiving sunlight, sunshine. We need to learn how to sit under the water of His Word and under the Son of Jesus Christ. You know, as we talk about resting in His goodness, and we're going to be talking about rest, we're going to be talking about Sabbath, primarily here in a few moments. We need to learn to trust and rely on God. This whole idea of resting in His goodness this whole idea of Sabbath talks about trusting God, relying on God. And I also talks about worship. I believe it's worship too. I believe the strongest and the most center point of worship is not the songs. It's not the instruments. And I, I love a lot of the lyrics. I love a lot of the songs. I love a lot. I think it's, it's not even the posture. And I think there's appropriate postures to worship God. Uh, but I believe worship at its core 
it is not, and some people I express it as obedience. And I, 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 I can concur with that. But even with obedience, even with all the songs and lyrics and melodies and postures, at its core is trusting God. Because you wouldn't be able to obey God if you didn't trust Him. You wouldn't be able to worship Him from your heart if you didn't trust Him. But at the core, worship is trusting and giving thanks to God for His goodness. But we just make it sense. Go with me. When you hope you turn here to Genesis chapter 2, I just want to reread this. After God said everything was good, He said, The heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Why? Because it was finished. He didn't, need to, he didn't need to work on it anymore. He didn't need to create another seed. He didn't need to create another insect. He didn't need to create another animal. He didn't need to create another body part. He didn't need to create another gender. He, he, he stopped with that. I mean, male and female, that's enough. We don't need more. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Okay, with that, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be going through this whole chapter. And based on my time left, I probably won't finish this today, uh, this section of it. But we're going to be reading through this. And let me read a, a good portion of this to start off with. And we'll come back and, and, and study this verse by verse. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear that any of you seem to have come short of it. We're in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to, to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For he who has belie hath believed do not do enter that rest, as he has said, so I sworn in my wrath, they shall not, not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he who has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day, in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, as Genesis 2 2, where we just quote read from. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again he designates a certain day, saying, In David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he, who, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore remains there for a rest for the people of God, for he who hath entered his rest hath himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Seeing then that we have passed a great, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but... He but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I just read 16 verses in, in Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to go through these verse by verse, at least for the most part. And, uh, uh, but I'm not going to finish this today, but we're going to get started from what I have. Are you guys on board with me so far? Everything up to this point has really been introductory as I'm talking about resting in His goodness. Resting in His goodness. Resting in His goodness because He will take care of everything. Okay. Enter into His rest. Let me just say this out the, out the, out the, out the, out the back. Enter into His rest is not automatic. We're going to see this a little bit later in verse 11, which we already read. 
but we have to learn to labor. Let me just read, read verse 11 real quick. It says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example. Let, let me toggle real quick to the King James regarding verse 11. And it says, Let, let us labor therefore. That's a different way of expressing being diligent. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Any, lest any man fall under the example of unbelief. We mean to learn how to labor to enter in our rest, and we're going to be explaining that. But I say that in the introduction to this section of our message, to say that entering to his rest is not automatic. There's a labor involved. Labor means work. Okay? Labor means diligence. There's an effort that, is done, that needs to be done. Even after being born again, even after resting in the finished work of the cross, we, we have a place of rest. But we have to learn to labor to enter into that rest. And that makes sense. Okay? In other words, let me, let me just say this. Going back to verse 1. Let, let us therefore fear that the promise being left, left us of entering into the rest, any of you should esteem to come short of it. So sorry about my little ringtone on here. Let me just turn this off. All right. Excuse me on that. Sorry about that. Let us therefore, let me read this again, verse 1. Hebrews 4, 4, 1. Let us therefore fear that the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Excuse me real quick, I want to toggle back to the New King James. Therefore, let me read it again. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Okay, now I've read that three times, I think we're good. Okay, let me just say this. A lot of what we're going to see here in Hebrews chapter 4, one of the main examples that the writer of Hebrews is using and is talking about entering his rest is Israel entering into the promised land. He's using this simultaneously as he's talking about this entering his rest. But we, therefore, when we're talking about entering into his rest, as we're talking about resting in his goodness, we need to believe God at his word the same way Israel had to believe God to come into the promised land. Let me say that again. We need to believe God at his word the same way Israel had to believe God at his word to enter into the promised land. That promised land, the Sabbath, the rest, are going to be used simultaneously. Okay? But just like Israel had to believe God at his word, we need to believe God in His Word regarding Christ. Okay? Am I making sense so far? God not only intended Israel to be delivered from Egypt, God intended for Israel to come into the Promised Land. Can I say that again? God, God did not just want to deliver Israel from Egypt. God wanted to bring Israel into the promised land. Am I making sense? Let me put this in New Testament terms. God does not just want to set you free from sin. God wants to bring you into the promised land, which is Christ. Praise God that Israel was delivered from Egypt in the bondage. Praise God for those who are set free from sin. But that is only part of the story. That is only part of the promise. That was only part of the goal. God wants to bring you out of Egypt, out of sin, yes. But God wants to bring you into the promised land. And let me just say this. The promised land is not just heaven. Yes, we will have a heaven. But that in itself is not the promised land. That is part of the promised land. That is a big portion of it. And I'm not trying to ask, I'm, I'm not trying to, to belittle heaven. But that's not all it is. Heaven is not exclusive to the promise. 
That's only part of the problem. A big portion, yes. But that's only part of it. Jesus said this way, this is eternal life. That we would know Him. That we would have a relationship with Him. He said that in John 17, verse 3. That this is eternal life. That you know Him. That we know God. That God wants to not only bring us out of Egypt, out of sin. But God wants to bring us into a relationship with God. Into the promised land. Into a Sabbath. Into a rest with God. Am I making sense so far? And we're going to dive into this a little deeper. Go to verse 2. Hebrews 4, 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. How was the gospel preached to them? Now they didn't have the gospel in the sense of, of being taught about Jesus. But yet they were. Remember, again, the, the, the Old Testament is a shadow of the things to come. The shadow of the New Testament. We're going to get into that pretty soon here in my notes. We'll, we'll look at that. I probably should already touch on it, but here we are. How was the gospel preached to them? If you read the book of Exodus, chapters 12 and 13 specifically, in that context, you will have what we were introduced for the first time, the Passover lamb. That's where the Passover lamb was introduced, was in the book of Exodus. Jesus is the ultimate lamb. But from the book of Exodus, while they were still in Egypt, they celebrated the Passover even to this day, when it all points to Christ. Are you following me? Because this is a major, major point that I'm making here. When the, they did not... Friends, as you listen to me, Israel did not... did not become... the. Israel was not delivered from Egypt because of their own goodness. It, Israel was not, let, was not delivered from, <clears throat> from Egypt because of their own holiness. Israel did not escape the last plague, the death of the firstborn, because of their goodness. Israel was delivered from Egypt and the, the last plague, the angel of death, because of the blood of the Lamb that they partake. The, 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 the blood of the Lamb was put on the doorposts of their home. And they consumed, it says, the sacrifice, which was the Lamb. Israel was delivered from the last plague, the death of the first one, the death of the first angel, and delivered from, the, the, from Egypt because of the Lamb. That's the gospel. You and I are not delivered from sin, are not delivered from hell, because of our own holiness and goodness, there's only one thing that has delivered you and set you free, and that is Jesus. Only Jesus has set you free. Only Jesus, the Lamb that represented Christ, that set Israel free from, and set, delivered them from the death angel, and from the from each of itself. We have to hear that. That was the gospel. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The gospel was illustrated and preached to them. But now we have the real sacrifice. We have the real sacrifice, Jesus. And God's word never fails. His word is faithful. We need to rest in his goodness. We need to rest in his word. We need to rest in the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, the blood of the lamb. We need to rest in his goodness. Because in his goodness, in this lamb, in this Jesus that we have received, everything we need for life and godliness is in there. If you need provision, it's in there. If you need healing, it's in there. If you need wisdom, it's in there. We're gonna, after this series, I'm going to be talking about the names of God. 
I'm going to be talking about a, a, a message t a title, a series entitled God Revealed. God has revealed himself through the seven names. But he's revealed, there's much more how God revealed himself. I'm going to be highlighting seven, and the seven names of God. And there's even more names of God than these seven names. But God has revealed himself. And we need to, if we, whatever you need, he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is our banner. He is our healer. He is our righteousness. Everything you need is in Jesus. And Jesus did not just provide heaven and the avoidance of hell. Jesus has provided everything you need. That's why I say heaven is only one portion of it. It's a major portion, but it's only one portion. Jesus has provided everything you need. Healing, wisdom, provision, reconciliation. God has provided everything you need in Christ Jesus. And we rest in His goodness when we trust in what He has provided. We rest, just like God rested in, 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 after He created the heaven and earth, He rested from His creation because it was finished. Just like Jesus sat down on the throne of God because he finished the work. We need to rest in what he has done, what he has promised, trusting in it, and sitting down on his throne until he makes our enemies our first. I'm getting a little right ahead of myself with that comment right there. But we need to rest in him. And we need to cease from our labor and labor to enter into his rest. I'm always making sense. See, God's word never fails. It's eternal. God's word is not natural. It's spiritual. It's eternal. But it's not released. God's word is not released by desire alone. We must believe His Word. True faith demands actions. But it's, e see, it's easier to pray and just wait for God to do something. <laughs> I'm talking about resting in His goodness and He will take care of everything. And what I just said sounds opposite right Yes, God is going to do it. But when I read scripture, many times when God does it, he operates through people. He does it. He's the source. Peter had to cast the net on the other side. God brought the fish. But Peter had to obey. Joshua had to walk around seven times. God knocked the walls down, but Joshua had to obey. The, the widow with oil had to go gather the jars. God brought the increase, but they had to obey. There was an action. God multiplied the fish and the loaves, but the disciples had to obey and, be, and, the, and, and begin to distribute the food. The miracle will come. God is the source. God will bless the work of your hand. God will bring the increase. God will honor his word. But we need to believe it. And respond as if we do. It's not just by a desire. We need to rest. We need to believe God. And rest in that. Stop trying to make it happen. And just believe it. And act like it's true. There's an attitude there. We're not, rest, we're not trying to make it happen by our actions. We are, we are acting like it's true. I don't just act like I'm married. I believe I'm true. It's not an act. I am married. And I need to act like it's true. I've had 20 years of practice. I'm not single anymore. Okay? And I need to believe it. I need to act like it's true. I know that might be a silly example, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point. We need to believe God. 
And the way we think, the way we talk, the way we, we conduct ourselves, we need to act like it's true. We're not trying to produce. God's not responding to our actions. No, our actions are responding to God. There's a big difference. In other words, many of us are waiting on God, but God is waiting on us to believe. We say we believe God, but our actions are saying a totally different message. There's a difference between believing God and desiring. It starts with the desire. Desire is good. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not attacking desire. But we need to just believe God and act like we do. And hopefully I'm making sense. I'm just about out of time. I think I'm going to leave it there because uh, the next three verses kind of go together and I don't want to get too, too wrapped up in this because I'm not going to be able to finish this in four minutes. But we're going to pick it up here and I'll probably read, read uh, here in Hebrews chapter 4. I thought I would get here a lot faster. But in American sense, we're talking about resting in His goodness. God has already promised that He's going to take care of everything. But we need to trust Him. We need to rest in Him. We need to rest in Him. You know, it's taken, we heard this word from God in 2004. It's 2020 now. It's taken us 16 years to understand what resting means. Now, I'm not just talking about, and when I'm talking about rest, I'm not talking about being lazy. I'm not talking about being complacent. I'm not talking about being passive. I'm talking about Taking, resting the way he said it's done, it's finished. If God says it, then that sells it. If God says, I'm going to be blessed, and blessed I am. I feel like I'm using you know, yoga. I'm blessed. If God says, by his strife I'm healed, then I'm healed. If God says, I'm blessed, then I'm blessed. He's my provider. We need to believe God and act like it's true. That's discipline. That's discipleship. That's knowing the truth and the truth set us free. I can know about the truth or I can know the truth. Big difference. That might make sense. We're talking about resting in His goodness, resting in His word. Because he will take care of everything. He already has through the cross. He will honor his word. He is faithful, 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 faithful. That way, that's why I'm not going to be governed by the circumstances. I'm going to let the circumstances be governed by my God. The just shall live by his faith. Not in me. Not in faith in my goodness, not in faith in my actions, not in faith in my response, faith in His Word. And God says it, it settles it. I don't care what it looks like. That's sometimes hard for my stinking thinking to get hold of. But it's true. I hope that makes sense. Well, let me just pray it out, Lord. We just thank you for your word. Lord, teach us all, including ourselves afresh what it means to rest in your goodness knowing you will take care of everything and may COVID and made everything else we're going through none of this caught you by surprise you know what we're going through you said you've bottled every tear you know the hairs on our head you are our shepherd we shall not be in want because we can rest in your goodness and you will take care of everything even in the year of drought, even in the year of famine, even though everyone may attack us, you have not forsaken us. You are a good, good Father. And we worship you, we magnify you, in Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. Have a great week. God bless.